right here. And there are sticks available with a little ring on the front and the back that you can run the strings through those rings. That's right. Now, after you get it run through the your belt loops, you just come up here and run that string through the ring on the front. And then you cinch it down on the back and get that thing pulled really tightly. And you tie it. And then you run it back behind. And skinnier people can probably bring it around and tie it on the front of them, too. But I'm afraid I'm just a little bit uh, oinky to be able to do that. <laughs> too much, honey. <laughs> itself is pulled out away from your neck so that the bees can't get up close to you and sting you. That's right. You can bend over, you can come back, and that elastic really stays down there tightly. All right, now that's one piece of equipment. And the next most important thing... Are your gloves. Now, Steve, if you were getting ready to go in the bees, you would probably have a long sleeve shirt on. Oh, I would probably have two on, wouldn't I? Yeah. Yeah, that I wouldn't be sense. looking like this. All right. And you know, another thing I'd probably do after I put my whole suit of equipment on, I'd probably take a smoker and smoke myself up real good too. That always helps. And that helps a whole your bunch. Hands. All right, now we've got our hive tool right ready to go. We've got a smoker right here. This is the basics. We've got a basic kit on. But why don't we take a look at a couple of other outfits that beekeepers might want to use in case they feel like this isn't enough for them. The best bee suit on the market today is an English bee suit made by a fellow named Brian Sheriff, Brian and his wife Pat. It has all of the advantages that every suit offers and really high quality. And Sandy, this is Sandy, she's putting her suit on right now. And I'm going to let her talk just a little bit about it. What are those zippers down there for, Sandy? Well, these are so that if you pull them up over your boots, that you can unzip them and then zip them back down over your boots or over your shoes whatever kind you're wearing. When I look at that, it's got elastic down here around the bottom, too. It does, which is really convenient. Sometimes I'll wear two pairs of socks and pull the socks up over the uh, the bottom of the suit to give me extra protection. Now, those would be white socks, wouldn't they? They would definitely be white socks. <laughs> We've learned that lesson already, haven't we? These do not like black. No, they don't. Now, if you'll help me a little okay. bit. There's also elastic around the wrist. And there's something that I really like about this suit. You zip it all the way up. And there's little Velcro pieces here. And what that's for is when I pull my veil over my head, like so, and get it all situated, I can grab these rings on the back and I can pull it around without very much help or without any help really from anyone else. And then, even though I've got a zipper that zips all the way here, there's a little hole right there. And some over-anxious bee can get in there and get in my veil and completely ruin my day. <laughs> so if I have this little bit of Velcro here, I can just pat that down, and no bee can get in at all. Uh, and it, it's really a well-working system. And I see there's a lot of pockets on it, too. There's a lot of pockets. They're all... And they've got Velcros, Velcro. too. I've got a place back here for my hive tool. I've got two side pockets, two front pockets, so I'm ready to put just about anything that I need to carry to the bee yard with me in my pockets. Well, what about gloves? Do you have any gloves? I have some gloves, and they are, excuse me, they are leather gloves that I prefer because they're a little bit thicker. Gosh, and they have vents here, too. Does that let the heat out? That lets the heat out, and a lot of people think that maybe you can get stung in these, but that's not the case because, you see, these gloves, this has a stiff gauntlet. Uh, gauntlet around it. And so what happens is when I pull this glove on, that holds that out away from my skin, plus the fact that my bee suit is going to be all the way down to my wrist anyway. And so this is not going to allow any bees to sting me through here just because that ventilation is there. And these gloves are, are really nice and soft, and I like these better. Is there anything that you could do to make those gloves last longer? Well, you can put mink oil on them. And a good idea with these gloves is just to sponge any honey or anything that you get on them off with a damp cloth, and then restore the smoothness of the leather with some sort of leather protector. 
and then you can wash this part of it by itself but don't just throw your whole glove in the washing machine or wash your whole glove and get this leather wet uh, that compresses the leather and then you don't have as much protection and as you said earlier it's always a good idea right before you go in the bees to smoke your hands and then that way uh, that'll keep the bees from landing on them as much and smoke down around the uh, around down around your ankles. ankles and just just your whole suit just get real smoked up real good that's right and then when you want to get out of this suit uh, you can if you don't need the veil anymore if the bees are calm or you don't uh, you want to go and have a bite to eat or get a drink then you just unzip this all the way around and it falls back like a car coat hood and it's real, in, it's real convenient just to go about and do whatever else you need to do until you get ready to go in the bees again. Well, that's great. Uh, I think we've gotten through the, uh, the hive and getting the equipment uh, put together and everything and just a little bit on, on equipment right now. Well, let's go on and take our next lesson <laughs> and see what's next. After you get your hive assembled and painted, what you need to do is you need to go out and put it in the location where you're actually going to put it before you get the bees in it. Now you're going to want to put your hive on something to keep it up off of the ground, to keep the weeds away from the front and to keep possibly skunks from getting into it. Any way that you want to do that's fine. If it's cinder blocks, if it's landscape timbers, if it's railroad ties, whatever it is. But there's a few considerations that you have to have. You want to point your hive south. You want to put it behind a windbreak so the wind's really not on it uh, very much at all. Those are a couple of the considerations that you have. I live out in the country and I really don't have to worry about many things, but if you have neighbors or you live in the city, there's other things that we ought to talk about. So let's go talk to a friend of ours about those considerations. When you finally get your bees and you get them in the hive, where in the world are you going to put them? Uh, there's an awful lot of recommendations for where you want to do that and most of them center around facing your hive to the south so that it'll get sun from early morning to late evening. Set it in a, in a uh, place where that it leans forward so that any moisture that comes out of the hive won't congregate on the bottom board and rot it out so that it'll run out of the front of the hive. And I like to put my beehive so that I can see them every day so that I can see where the bees are working. But a lot of you are going to be in the cities and, uh, and today we're with Dr. John Ambrose, our state entomologist, that has some recommendations for us for where that you might want to keep your bees in your backyard if you're keeping bees in the city. Now, Steve, it's true, be keeping bees in the city is a little different than keeping them out in the countryside. And I've got a transparency set up. Why don't we go take a look at that and we can talk about how you do manage your hives in the city. Great. Steve, what we have here is a typical backyard. This is your house with perhaps an attached garage in your city lot and your neighbor's over here, and you decided you wanted to keep bees. Well, there's several things to consider, and as you were saying, some of them are to have it facing towards the sun so it gets morning sun, a little bit about drainage so you don't have water, and people like to face it so they can watch their bees. But if you've got neighbors, then there's a few other things that they can take into consideration. The first thing that people normally ask in a situation like this is, well, how many hives can I have? So let's put a couple of hives on here, and let's turn them so they're both facing the right way with the brood chambers in the bottom. How many hives can you have in, a, in your backyard? And the thing is, there's no magic number. But as a rule of thumb, in the typical city lot, I would say that a person shouldn't have more than four hives. Now, assuming that you've got, and let's work with two hives, and the minimum actually is two. And the reason I say that, it's not a good idea to have one hive of bees. Because if something goes wrong with your bees and you have a second hive, you can usually fix it. You can get some brood, you can get some honey, you might even be able to get a queen. So two, two hives are the way to go. And another thing is if you've got two hives, you can understand better and you've got something to compare the other one to. Exactly right. Otherwise, if you're a beginner, you may not know what's supposed to happen. Well, the question then is, we've got two hives and we're working with that, where do you put them? And people talk about setbacks. How far from the property line or how far from your neighbor's house should your hives be? As a rule of thumb, we should probably keep our hives at least 15 feet back from the property line. Now, it may be further than that, depending on what's going on on the other side of the property line. If your neighbors had a backyard grill right up against your property line, then you might want to have it back further. If that were the case, then what you could do is you could give your bees a little more protection from your neighbors, actually, by putting in a hedge. And here what we're talking about is planting an evergreen hedge or building a fence, something that's about eight feet tall, so that when your bees fly, the bees tend to fly up and over. And once they're over the hedge, they'll fly out of that, area, that height and they won't bother your neighbors. And your neighbors will never see them flying when they fly up like that and get up above their heads, will they? That's right. 
You matter of fact, unless you tell your neighbors you have these behind that hedge, they may not even realize they're there. So setting them back far enough, putting a barrier if they're close, are all considerations. The other thing to consider is, when you place your hives, don't place them in a situation where they're in a walkway. For example, you wouldn't want to place them near a sidewalk so that when people are using the sidewalk, the bees are going to fly out. And whether they sting the person or not, the person's going to be alarmed, he's going to swat at them, the kids are going to swat at them. You want to avoid that kind of situation. You so don't want them to be a nuisance. You don't want them to be a nuisance, exactly. So move them back and position them so wherever their flight path is, it's not over driveways, it's not over walkways, it's not over areas where people are going to congregate. It's not over cars, and it's not over fresh laundry lines either. <laughs> Now, what else should you consider? Well, one of the things that you need to consider with keeping bees in the backyard is the same thing that you would consider wherever you put them, and that's to make sure they have something to eat. So you need some flower sources. Now, what are those flower sources going to be? Almost anything that's in bloom that has an odor, the bees are going to work. And it's nice to have some of those flower sources in your yard so that your bees aren't flying over your neighbors all the time. But the thing is, if your neighbors have flowers growing in their backyard and the bees are visiting them, there's a good chance they're pollinating them. They're making fruits, they're making nuts, they're setting seeds. Let your neighbors know, know that your bees are doing them a favor. Now, assuming that you've done all that, there are a few things to consider so they don't create a problem. And probably one of the most important things is water. Bees have to have a water source. They use water to dilute the honey to feed the young bees, and they also use water to cool the hive, a kind of air conditioning, and they'll collect it. And bees are very, very clever about this. They'll collect water from the closest source. So if you've got water in your backyard, and your neighbors have water in their backyard and their water source is closer, property lines don't mean anything to the bees. They're going to go to your neighbor's water source. So let's put up a water source. In this case, your neighbors have a bird bath. They've got it in their backyard and it's closer to your hives than anything that you have in your backyard. And the bees fly over there. They'll fly over there and they'll collect the water and they may turn into a nuisance. Your neighbors call, say, my birds can't use the bath. I want you to stop it. Well, this isn't too bad because what you can do to get the bees to stop using the neighbor's water source is two things. One is to create your own water source closer to the hives, and that can be any of a number of things, just a bucket of water where water is dripping or something that you have to fill, but water with a little bit of movement is always the best, and something shallow so your bees won't drown. It's good to put things like pine needles or anything that will keep the bees from drowning because they'll, they'll easily drown in water like that. That's right, exactly right. Shallow running water is the best situation. But the other thing you have to do is you have to eliminate temporarily this other water source because bees learn things. They learn where flowers are, and that's called flower fidelity. They learn where water is, and that's called water fidelity. So what you want to do is you want to eliminate temporarily that water source. And you either drain the water bath or the bird bath for a few days, cover it up, or even remove it from the yard. And then after three or four days, after your bees have learned their new water source, you can go ahead and take the bird bath, put it back. The bees will have switched to the new water source, and you've no longer got a problem. Now that was pretty easy. But let's assume that instead of a bird bath being your neighbor's water source, it was something a little bigger, like a swimming pool. Oh, there's lots of problems <laughs> caused because of swimming pools. I know that. And this is the one that really gives beekeepers a bad name. Your bees go to the swimming pool and they start collecting water. The kids are afraid. The people who use the pool are afraid. The bees are probably drowning because the pool is so deep. What do you do in a situation like that? Now, you can go ahead and put your water source there, like I said before. But remember the second part. You've got to eliminate the water there. Can you convince your neighbors to drain their pool for four days? Can you convince them to put a tarp over it for four days? In most cases, probably not. So the best thing to do is never to get in that kind of situation. As soon as you bring your hives into the backyard, create a water source, let the bees learn it, and make sure that your water is always closer than your neighbor's water. If you do nothing else to keep your bees away from the property line and to make sure they have a water source, you'll solve 90% of your potential problems with keeping bees in the city. Having done all that, let your neighbors know that your bees are doing them a favor, and at the appropriate time of the year, take them a jar of honey and uh, we won't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Ambrose, thanks an awful lot for this lesson. We certainly do appreciate it. No, you're welcome, Steve. Every single beehive has one queen bee, and it has an awful lot of worker bees, and it has some drones, too. I've got a chart behind me that explains an awful lot of the biology of bees, which, which will help me right here. Let me point right up here. We have three different looking individuals in a beehive. We have a queen with a long abdomen. We have a worker bee 
And then we have a drone with huge compound eyes. Now, all of these bees right here, three different bees come from one egg. And it starts already getting amazing, doesn't it? The queen bee, this chart below it, shows the, the period as the, bees, uh, uh, as the bees progress. The first three days of the queen's life, she's an egg. After the third day, the egg hatches. Then day four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, the larvae are feeding. In day 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 of her life, the larvae spins a cocoon and transforms under a capped brood frame. And then on the 16th day of her life, she emerges as a queen bee. She emerges from a cell that looks like this right here. Now, this is a brood frame. This is a frame of brood, and it's a cross section. It's cut off right here so that you can see it. This is how it's oriented in the hive right here. It stands up straight. You can see the cells are like this. They're not out here straight. They're cupped like this. And there's a reason for that, just as there is in everything in a beehive. The queen is raised in a cell that's a vertical cell right here. And a lot of people say that they look like a peanut. And as we said, the queen emerges from the time that first egg is laid. In 16 days, she emerges. She starts off as a fertilized egg. And she's fed a special diet and put in this special vertical cell. And that's what makes her a queen. Now let's look at a worker bee. A worker bee is the individual that does all of the work in the hive. She's an egg for three days also. She goes into her larval stage from the fourth to the ninth day. She's capped after that, and capping right over here on these cells. You can see how the cells are capped. It's capped. She stays in the pupil state till the 20th, and then she emerges on the 21st day. The drone takes a little bit longer. Three days as an egg. The larval state is the same. And then they stay in the pupa state longer, emerging on the 24th day. The drones are in a larger cell than the worker cells. The worker cells are smaller than the drone cells. And you can see the difference in the comb. Uh, it's obvious on the comb. You can tell the difference between the worker and the drone cells. Now, as these bees emerge, they automatically go into different tasks. Or as the worker bee emerges, she goes into different tasks. On the first and second day, she works cleaning the cells and keeping the brood warm. Days three, four, and five, she, she feeds the older larva. She works in this brood nest or nursery of the beehive, feeding the younger larvae and getting them started. She produces uh, a substance called royal jelly under her body and feeds this special dye to these bees. On days 12 to 17, she produces wax, she builds combs, she transports food within the hive. On days 18 to 21, she guards the hive entrance. And then on the rest of her life, from days 22 to about days 45, she visits flowers, she pollinates them, she collects pollen, nectar, propolis, and water. She goes out and she works out in the world like that. That's a field bee. Up here are hive bees. So they're a hive bee from days 1 to about day 21, and then day 22 on down to 45 to the end of their life. 45 days is not very long, and an awful lot of people are really surprised that a bee only lives 45 days. But then there's a difference in spring and summer bees and fall bees, too. Some bees actually live all the way over the winter. The queens can live an awful lot longer than that. The queens live up to three or maybe even longer years. Um, the drones live throughout the season. Uh, they're there for only one reason, and that's to pollinate or to fertilize the queen. When the drone does that, the drone dies. If the drone doesn't and makes it through the season, the worker bees at the end of the season will actually kick the old boy out. And the drones are a funny thing. They, they leave the hive during the day, and they'll go out of the hive, and they'll kind of just hang around with the guys in place called congregating areas. They'll stay out there and, and look for queens. And if any, any of them see a queen or or smell a queen flying, they'll come back and tell the other guys, and all of them will go after her and take after her and chase. And as I said, the only purpose for a drone bee is to mate with the queen. Now, the bees inside of the colonies talk to each other in an awful lot of different ways. But one of the, the most obvious ways is by pheromones, or chemical smells. Here you can see a bee with her abdomen raised. And this segment of her body right here is creating a smell, and she's fanning that smell through the hive. The hive of bees 
is a sexy smelling place. Our scientists have already identified over 200 different smells in a beehive. When you go into a beehive, if you don't wear gloves, and I would recommend that anybody that starts keeping bees to wear all the protective gear that they can as they start off. When you first go in, you can take your hand and stick it down into the beehive, and the beehive is actually about 98 degrees, and the humidity is right at 50%. They can air condition and heat their hives, they can cool it down, they can heat it up, they can do some things that we really have a hard time doing in our, in our society. Uh, I know it certainly is expensive for us to keep our house warm in 98 degrees, we can't even come close to that. Bees feed each other all the time. They, they won't actually go down and, and eat themselves. They'll go up to another worker and they'll take their antenna. They do a lot of communicating through their antenna and they'll tap another worker with her and they'll say, feed me and, and she'll actually feed them. Somebody took a drop of radioactive honey and gave a bee one drop of radioactive honey and in 24 hours over 95 percent of the bees in that colony had radioactivity inside of their body because they're constantly feeding each other. They have a, a sense of unity. And, and if you think about the analogy that goes with people too, when, when we're entertaining people, we'll have them over to our house and we'll enjoy a meal with them. There's an awful lot of similarities between bees. Uh, there's an awful lot of reasons to keep bees. And one of them obviously is the tremendous benefit that's given to pollination, to agriculture through pollination. When a bee goes into, a foraging bee goes into a flower, she has a small electric charge on her body and when she goes in, the pollen jumps right up. I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever taken a comb and combed it through your hair and held it down on little pieces of paper, but that's a, a static electricity and bees have that. It brings the pollen up on their body, just like that right there. And then they have special combs on their legs and they comb their, their hair and they add a little bit of honey to it and they pack it in these little pollen baskets on their legs and they take it back to the hive. Bees collect nectar and they collect pollen. The nectar is the carbohydrates in their diets, the taters that we eat. The pollen is the protein in their diet and they have to have a combination of the two. The bees go out, they collect the nectar, they collect the pollen, they connect a, a resiny substance called propolis that they stick the hive together with and they collect large amounts of water because they work with the moisture of the hive. They add water to the honey to bring it back to a consistency that they can use and they work with the, with the uh, humidity in the hive. Now, during the year, if the colony of bees gets, uh, um, gets overcrowded or just for some of a, of a lot of different reasons, the bees will swarm. And here's a picture of bees swarming right here. They decide to leave and they leave queen cells. A queen cell is a queen that's going to emerge. I told you earlier that there's only one queen in a hive. But when the bees decide to swarm, they'll actually leave queen cells, more queens in a colony. And then they'll leave. They'll take the old queen and they'll go out and swarm and they'll look for a new place to live. And I use this as an analogy for people going out and shopping for a new house. They're real happy. They're full of honey. They won't sting you. You can actually go up to a swarm and, and mess with it and, uh, um, and there's a real good chance that, that the bees won't swarm or won't sting you. A lot of people even suspend queen cages from their chin and, and have a bee beard uh, just to show people how, how gentle bees are when they're swarming like this. Now again, let me warn you, you know, if you're just starting with beekeeping, you don't want to get out here and mess with bees and not have protective gear on. Keeping bees is an art. It's an art and, and the more that you do it, the more that you learn about what you're doing, the better you get at it and the better that you understand it. Now we know where we're going to put our bees. The next lesson that we need to talk about is maybe the most important lesson of all and that's how to use this thing right here and it's called a smoker. Uh, we're going to go to three different commercial beekeepers and talk to them about how they use their smoker. Now each one of them uses a different fuel indigenous of their area because people have different smoker fuels available. This might be one of the best lessons coming because this smoker is what controls the bees. So let's go see what we can learn about a smoker. The most important tool that any beekeeper uses is a smoker because smoke is a natural enemy to the bees. When bees smell smoke, they think that there's a fire in the woods and they might have the possibility of losing their hive. They start fanning their wings because they know that the temperature is going to come and they start sucking up honey just as hard as they can go and we as beekeepers can do anything to them that we want to do. 
Now here's a smoker right here. All a smoker is is a bellows that blows air through a heat chamber. The real art of a smoker is in knowing how to get large volumes of cool smoke that's not offensive to the beekeeper that the bees will recognize. Every area has different smoker fuels. We're up in North Carolina, and there's an awful lot of textiles in North Carolina, so I use a, a smoker fuel that's cotton mill waste. It works really well for us. We're down here in Florida right now with my friend Ralph Wadlow, and Ralph uses the bark of the Malaluca tree. The bark of the Malaluca tree gives him a really good smoke, but Ralph, with all of his experience, even goes a step further than that. After he gets his Malaluca bark going, he takes Spanish moss and uses it as a filter that goes up above and the smoke comes through the filter and goes out. It makes a cooler smoke, it's better for the bees, and it's also better for the beekeepers. Ralph and I are going to see if we can light our smokers now, get them going, and see how we can do with volumes of smoke. Let's see what we can do here, Ralph. One of the real benefits for me with this cotton mill waste is once you've got a little bit of it that's already been burned, and you put a spark on it, it gets going pretty quickly. And you can get it, get it going real well. Let me get my top down here and get the puffing. Okay, Ralph's got his bark going pretty good now, and if you'll see, you can see it's really making large volumes of smoke. As I said, Ralph has an awful lot of experience. He knows how to get those things going real well. And then that Spanish moss that he's going to put on the top of it cools it, and it also keeps any of the ash from coming out on the bees. Come on, Matt. Where's your smoke? Where's your smoke, brother? <laughs> Okay, look at the difference there. <laughs> Ralph's got a whole lot of smoke and I don't have that awful much. One of the masters, master beekeepers know how to get large volumes of smoke out and that's what you want to be able to do. You want to get good volumes of smoke to be able to control the bees. We're down in LaBelle, Florida with Mel Greenleaf. Mel is the vice president of Hybrid Bees, and he's the fellow that raises those Starline and Midnight Queens that everybody likes so much. We've come down for Mel to show us how he lights a smoker, because we're trying to learn how to get high volumes of smoke out of a smoker. And Mel's got a couple of techniques that he uses. But one of the techniques that I've already seen that I like is the organization of his truck. He's got everything in its place and a place for everything. And that's how all we beekeepers are supposed to be. It makes things more efficient. So we're gonna get these smokers and go back here and see if we can get them going. Mel, what kind of fuel do you use in your smoker? Well, we have a couple different choices. We use these wood chips that we can get from a local pulpwood plant. They're sort of a rough uh, cut chip, and uh, we use those pretty commonly. They're fairly easy to light, and they stay lit for a long time. I'm not always having to stop to fill the smoker, and I really like that. We also can collect some pine needles uh, from a number of areas around, and uh, I like those uh, to light, but they require a little bit more filling the smoker frequently, and so it slows you down when you're in the bee yard working. So I really prefer these chips. The big drawback of the chips is we have to pay for those, and uh, we try to cut corners wherever we can and save our money as much as possible. Hey, boy, that's how the bee business <laughs> is, isn't it? Well, let's see if we can get this thing going. Uh, we have a whole lot of both of those. We have a whole lot of pine needles and a whole lot of wood chips just like that up in North Carolina. Let's see how we can get this thing going here. Okay. Well, to me, now, this is about the hardest part of beekeeping, I think, is uh, lighting your smoker and getting your smoker going. 
So uh, once we get through those two steps, I think we should be in pretty good shape beekeeping wise. I think it's real important to clean out the old smoker fuel. As you can see, it's pretty much well burned and uh, it mostly just slows down the lighting process and uh, keeps your smoker from really developing a good flow of uh, smoke. I put a little handful or so in there and then I have this uh, mineral spirits or paint thinner. Now it's a little bit hard to get these things started. You can use a number of different uh, methods, but I like to do this. It's real important not to put too much in there because if you put a lot in there, it'll leak on your truck and you stand a chance of lighting your truck on fire. And that uh, would certainly put a ruin in the day, wouldn't it? When, uh, when we use wood chips like that, I've always taken cardboard and tried to get it going with cardboard, but goodness gracious, that certainly does make it a whole lot easier. There's a real trick right there, Mel. And it takes a little while. Right now, we're mostly just burning off the mineral spirits, and so I like to uh, let the fire go for a while until I'm sure I got a good bed of coals down in the bottom. And then I can go ahead and put some more smoke, smoker fuel on top of that. That's really a, uh, that's gonna, that's gonna do a real good job there. I think most beekeepers have to be real careful because of course you can shoot flames off and you can start a number of things on fire depending on what kind of countryside you're in. And I've known of a couple of beekeepers who've accidentally started areas on fire and the fire department had to be called one instance. So uh, really? hopefully that won't happen to us today. Well, I think with a bee man of your experience, uh, uh, how long have you been raising the star line in Midnight Queens? Uh, I've been in the program since 1977 and I've been in, directly in, involved and in charge of the program since 1978. So for the past 12 years, I've been sort of, you know, in charge of everything here now. Uh, uh, for the for the people that don't know, the Starline and Midnight Bees are, are two of the well, really probably the only two. Well, there's there's a, maybe another brand of, of hybrid bees right now going, but they're the two leading hybrid bees that are that are being raised in the United States right now. That's correct. And the Starline program was originally started by Bud Kale, and it was through his determination and hard work and skills the program was established in the 40s. And he developed a number of cooperators from that beginning and developed Starline's fine reputation. I just was sort of lucky enough to come along at the right time when, uh, when they needed a change and Bud Kale's health was failing, unfortunately. So that gave me the opportunity to take, off the, take over the program. And I think it's been my hard work and effort that's kept the program alive. But certainly Bud Kale deserves all the credit for the Starline and Midnight program. Uh, we have, through our catalog, we, we advertise with Morris Weaver and Morris sells the Midnights and the Starlines. Can, can people buy the, the queens directly from you or do you just you just supply the breeder queens to the breeders that raise the queens from them? Right. So Hybrid Bees primarily provides the breeder queens to the different cooperators. We do offer a brokerage service where if someone doesn't know who to contact, we can refer them to a number of people that uh, they might be able to buy queens from. But we, we actually do not handle the queens, the finished queens themselves. And that Midnight Queen is really a good queen for the beginner too, isn't it? Uh, I think that the Midnight has a reputation for being a little more gentle than the Starline. The biggest problem with the Midnight, of course, it's a black bee and it's hard to find the queen in a colony uh, of black workers. Now, I'm going to interrupt you here. It looks like we've got a pretty good be uh, bed of coals going down there, and that's what I like to see, a good hot bed down there. I think that's a secret to getting the smoker started right and going, lasting with you all day long. So I'm going to go ahead and start throwing some more on top there. There was something else that I noticed when we came up too, and I don't know if the people saw it. You've got a cork that you keep on the end of your smoker to, to cut the, the uh, oh boy, that's, already we're doing well here, aren't we? <laughs> We can almost barbecue off that thing. <laughs> but you keep a cork in the end of it. When, you, when you're through with it, you cork it up, and that puts the fire completely out, don't it? Well, actually, no. Actually, the, the cork I use uh, is one that has some flutes on it. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's got three little flutes. It allows the smoker to breathe a little bit. That way I can, uh, you know, you can kind of see a little bit coming out. That way I can go from bee yard to bee yard and the smoker stays lit and I don't have to worry about relighting at each stop I make. What a great idea. Well, let's see what kind of smoke you got going with that thing. I think we're about ready to tackle a beehive. It looks pretty good. Well, here we are, folks. We've got one of the best queen breeders in the United States. He's showing us how to light that smoker. We've got high volumes of smoke and we're ready to go into the bees. We're down in Coward, Alabama with Andy Webb. Andy is a fifth generation beekeeper and a third generation queen breeder. He's gonna show us how he fires his smoker up. Okay, Andy, let's see, let's see how we do. What kind of fuel do you use? We use the short uh, pine needles. They seem to work the best and control the bees better than anything that we've found. Pine needles really make a real mild smoke too, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's more pleasant to smell than some of the straws and uh, haze and different things that people use. Basically, get you just get you a good fire going before you stick it in the fire chamber, and uh, get it puffing real good. 
You can just add as, as you need it until you get it full. So you fill it slap up, huh? Yes, we fill it. And you can listen to the sound in the chamber once you've gotten used to it and tell whether you, whether you need to add more. But it needs to be very full because a, a, a good cool smoker controls the bees a whole lot better than a hot smoker. A hot smoker will make your queen run and you'll, you'll have a lot more trouble finding your queen if you have a hot smoker. No kid. Uh, hot being the, the temperature of the smoke coming out. So really, when you pack those pine needles or in there, the more you pack in there, it filters that smoke as it comes out, doesn't it? I would assume it does. I've never thought of it that way, but I would say it would, yeah. And it, it doesn't let your chamber get quite as hot. And uh, that's the reason we stuff it so full. You can just keep stuffing it. A lot of people just put just enough to go to the hive, but always keep your smoker well stuffed. We've uh, we've been working with uh, with a bunch of different beekeepers to try to show our our uh, our the people that buy these videos how to get that smoker going, and I've seen I've seen a lot of different ways now, and I hate to say it, but uh, I think that's the best smoke I've seen going. Yeah. A lot of people tell me that that the pine needles uh, burn out real quickly, uh, but I'll tell you what, it's going to take a long time to go through this many pine needles right here. Well, we know how to get those smokers going and get that smoke out of it. Now's the big moment. It's time to put some bees into this hive. We're going to start with a package of bees because that's the way most beekeepers start with it. So let's get on out of here and see if we can't put some bees into this hive. We're down in LaBelle, Florida with America's first family of queen breeders and packaged bee producers, the Curtis family. To my left is Harold Curtis his daughter, Renee Pratt, and right here is the patriarch of the family, George Curtis, a man who has more experience breeding queens than most anybody else in the United States. We've come down here today to get Harold and, and George and Renee to tell us how they install packages so beekeepers will know how to put in a package of bees. So we've come out here, we've got a package of bees, and we're ready to go. Harold was telling me that the most important thing about ever sticking in a package of bees is to go to one of your existing colonies and pull out a frame of brood. Harold, have we got a frame of brood? No, but we'll get one. We'll okay. We'll dive right here and we'll take one out of it. It makes the bees stick with the brood. They all cluster to it and they won't uh, drift so bad, especially if you have uh, 10 or 15 hives uh, and you want to start them all at the same time, you have to... Uh, uh, Watch your queen might be on that uh, excluder. A lot of boys yesterday. It works a lot better if you have a frame of brood for them to uh, cluster to. It also gives them a start. You got a hatching brood. You don't have to take the bees out of this colony here. All you want is the brood. You already have honey, something for them to eat on. Make sure you don't have the queen. Shake them off back into the hive. Okay, Steve, set that over. We're going to take the lid off, take one of your new combs out. You see a hatching brood pollen, the whole ball away. Take one of the frames out. We're going to install it right down in here. OK, so we're going to put that frame of brood right down in there. We shake all the bees off and leave it in there. Then you can take this, high, this frame here and put it back into your other colony of bees. They'll draw it out for you. And uh, you'll never have to change it back. You should just leave it in there. That'll be fine. And. Uh, this also makes the bees stay. Okay, here's the package now. The way we usually do it, we've got it nailed on here. You have to prise it up, take your lid off, and you can see that your queen is hanging in here uh, beside your feed can. She's stapled. So you want to get down here where you can get to this thing and shake, shake your bees down. Lean it over, tilt your cage over, pick it at the same time, flip out your screen like that there. Pull your can out. Now that's a can of sugar syrup right there. Now he's right. pulling up the queen that's in a little queen right. cage. A lot of people aren't going to aren't going to understand how they need to to uh, uh, to to be able to uh, um, get that that syrup can out there and bang those bees down. But you've got to do that. You've got to get the bees down there. You've got to bang them to the bottom so they don't fly out. Bang her down. All right. That's what you do. You shake it down like that there. You pull this out, put your lid back on it after you take your queen out. All right, you have your bees all in. You have your syrup with holes already in it. Why not use it just for a sprinkler? This lets these bees all get with the sugar water syrup. They'll feed up, get good and fat, and they won't fly out and sting you, or they won't also won't go 